how much energy and passion and how much are you willing to, how much do you care really about it? Um, and, and caring about things and, and the energy and the passion can trump a lot of inexperience and a lot of not knowledge, right? Um, if that didn't, if that wasn't true, I wouldn't be here because I didn't have any experience. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. I know we don't talk about gear a lot on this show. Uh, Part of that is I think gear is kind of this rabbit hole that keeps people from actually getting out there rather than just saying, you know, pick something and go. Um, we heard on Monday, Jessica Mills was talking about, uh, you know, gear is not the most important thing on your trips, you know, unless, it, unless it's like life or death, you know, and you need something to keep you alive. That's one thing. But for most of us and most of our adventures, just about what we have will do or some relatively affordable gear. And, uh, I really like this company, uh, climate. They make sleeping pads and make other things, but I have one of their sleeping pads that I bought, six years ago now, and I've slept on it probably 300 plus nights and it has still held up perfectly. I have, and that's all outside. I've put it straight on parking lot asphalt. I've slept in the back of my truck for two weeks in a row one time. Um, and I've just had it in so many places, uh, gosh, so many situations and it's performed great. It's never leaked and it was super affordable. And so I, you know, when I saw the, the climate booth at outdoor retailer, I'm like, ah, I would love to talk to the CEO to hear about their story. How did they get to this point? Um, I, I really don't care much about gear, but this is one product I do like one company I really do like. And so, uh, little did I know their story is not what I expected. You know, I just think, you know, people have an idea, release a product and go from there and it just builds and builds and builds. But as you'll learn, uh, you know, the path to success is long. It has a lot of unexpected turns, a lot of unexpected falls, a lot of unexpected victories. And I think this would be a great resource for anybody out there in any sport that has an idea that they're wanting to pursue for something that would improve their sport or improve, um, their subculture and, uh, make life better for them. Uh, this is one of those stories and there's a lot of wisdom that Corey shares that you can learn from. And I think he'd be a great resource for you. If you have something in mind that you want to start pursuing, um, I, I, and they started in a totally different direction from where they are now, but I'll, I'll, I won't spoil that. I'll let you, um, or I'll let him tell the story. So today's sponsors, athletic brewing, another startup, uh, they make non-alcoholic craft beer, and that takes a lot of guts too. You know, the craft beer market is, you know, the, the industry is growing. And to say I'm not going to make non-alcoholic is is a big jump. So support them. Uh, the show notes have a link to where you can get a deal, as well as another startup that uh, is sponsoring us, CS Instant Coffee, 100% Arabica instant coffee in little singer sort of pouches, so that you can take them backpacking with you or or on the, on the trail somewhere. Um, so take your climate pad. Take a six pack of athletic brewing and some CS instant coffee and sounds like a good time to me. All right, let's do this. Oh, by the way, have a great weekend. Hey folks, today we have Corey Toll. He's the CEO of Climate, one of my favorite outdoor brands. They make uh, sleeping pads and they, they started off making something very different and, uh, but we'll talk about that in a second. Corey, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going? Glad to be here. Yeah, man. Thanks for doing this. Um, you know, like I mentioned, you guys are known for making sleeping pads now, but you know, when you started out, you were known for making something pretty different. <laughs> Could you tell us about, uh, what that was? <laughs> yeah. Back in the day, um, our founder, Nate Alder, had come up with an idea. He was actually scuba diving in Brazil, 
when he learned that they used this gas called argon in the in the deep sea scuba suits. They used it for flotation purposes and also it had some good insulative properties. He was also a snowboarder, so he uh, thought how cool would it be to have a snowboarding coat that I could inflate with this argon gas, um, you know, control my insulation, have something that's lightweight but really warm still, uh, et cetera. So he had this crazy idea. Um, he's a student at BYU, and he came up with this crazy idea. He put together some business plan, you know, went to com- competitions and pitches, and that's where the very, very, very first idea for the whole uh, for climate came. Um, when we launched our first product, it was a little bit different than what he was visioning. Probably we launched with a line of vests. In fact, we actually tried to license the technology first and then had a hard time doing that. A lot of people expressed interest, a lot of brands, but they like they ever wanted to see it kind of in, in work and in, in action. So we had to go out there and develop the product to the point when we got to the point where we're like, well, let's just launch it under our, under our own brand and see if we can still license it. And that was kind of the very beginning launch point of climate. So were you involved at that point? Yeah, I came on when the idea was just, you know, uh, just a thought in his head. I, I came on specifically to develop the product, commercialize it, get it to the point where we could manufacture and sell it. So so you knew Nate at that point? Nope, I didn't know. Nate, I was working for another company and we were, we were, uh, we, we did product design for other, for, for people. And uh, we had, we were hosting this competition called Invented in Utah, you know, crazy inventors and submit their ideas. They come and pitch in front of a panel. The winner gets some awards and some cash to kind of go out there and try to make it happen. And, and Nate ended up winning, Nate and his team, Climate, ended up winning um, that competition. They didn't have a prototype or anything. It was just an idea. I think, in fact, they were pitching with like a balloon and like a jacket. Like, imagine this balloon inflating and here's the jacket. And and so that's how our introduction to them was. And then I, I got to know them. I knew a couple of the guys in the company at that time. And then they knew that I did product development. So that's when they brought me on. Oh, very cool. So, so you like the business side or, or do you also like, uh, adventure sports as well? And if so, uh, what sports? Uh, me, I, I, I like it all ski. I don't snowboard. I tried it once and about killed myself multiple times. So I'm definitely a <laughs> skier. If I, uh, but I like it all. If I, if, I, if I had to pick and choose, I would, I would probably say I'm more of a summer guy. I'm a more of a water ski guy than a snow ski guy, but if it's outdoors, I, I love to do it. So man, so, so you hear the idea and you're, you're, you're working in product manufacturing or development. What, what, in, what got you on board? Like what, what about this idea that you just decided to go into it and, and take it on? For me, the, the thing that was most intriguing was just the craziness of the idea. You're right. And, 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 and it sounds brilliant. It end up, and ended up that there are some serious complications with the product. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, the whole idea that you can use this gas to inflate and insulate cool outdoor product, whether that be gear or whatnot is really what attracted me because it was more technology, right? It wasn't, it wasn't, um, uh, come and design apparel. I'm an engine mechanical engineering by trade. And so that, you, you know, that, that would not have probably attracted me if it was, Hey, come and design a line of uh, outdoor apparel for me. I'd be like, what are you, why are you asking me? But the fact that it was techie and very different, we were going to have to develop, uh, we're going to have to develop machinery and equipment to prototype this new concept, this new technology. That That's really what attracted me. And then just the vastness of where we could potentially take it was what, what hooked me. Well, I hate to hear that the, uh, the idea didn't pan out. A lot of crazy ideas don't, but it seems like you guys pivoted okay. And, uh, you know, do, do you ever still see people wearing that vest or uh, still using the Argon product? You know, it's funny. We still see people wearing one around once in a while, and they'll be like, I love this thing, and it, it, I wish the population was bigger <laughs> for people that loved it, but there, it just wasn't. There were, there were a couple of potent, you know, significant challenges. One was we were trying to use argon gas to inflate it, which was very difficult just from the logistics, right? You have to carry around these gas canisters to, insulate, to inflate your pad. So we had to abandon that idea fairly early on and we and we and and we pivoted and tried to hand pump that you could pump up ambient air which still worked great you still get the custom fit you don't have the warmth of the argon as much but you get the warmth of the air which is still a great insulator so it was still a decent idea where where we struggled and well there's probably lots of problems right number one and you don't want an engineer designing apparel that's one thing for specifically but we were trying <laughs> to sell it for us har- a hard good yeah um and, and so that was a little bit different, right? No one else was really selling a, a piece of apparel kind of like we were with uh, as a hard good. 
Um, I, I think the breathability challenges when you know you're trying to retain a gas or air in your in your jacket, and at the end of the day, we're all active in the outdoor person. You don't really want to be sweating too much. So it really worked well with people that were always cold, but not with people that were going from a, a, a cold climate to a warm climate because you'd still sweat in it um, because of the lack of breathability. So some of those some of those challenges kind of kind of made it uh, too difficult for uh, for us to to make it work you know at the very least it's a very interesting idea i guess you just guys got to the i guess you guys just got to the point that you thought you know it's just not worth it to us anymore to try to figure this out yeah and, and anything in my opinion anything solvable like with the right um, if, if the right amount of money and the right amount of resources that you want to throw at it but really we had we had run it to the end of its uh you know runway and, and just really couldn't get it off off the runway, so to speak. So I, I think it's still some, you know, very op- cool opportunities with it, but it's going to take a lot more, a lot more capital and resources than what we were willing to put into it to make it work. No, I, I get it. That seems incredibly daunting. Um, so we, you know, obviously you guys didn't shut down. Uh, you're still going strong ever since. So, so what did that pivot in your direction look like um, away from the jackets and into the sleeping pads? So yeah, take you back a little bit of memory lane. Twenty two thousand nine, end of two thousand nine is when we launched the jackets or the vests, I should say. The, we got their first round of production in two thousand ten. We really started to see signals that it was going to be harder to get market distribution than we thought. And so, of course, me as a head of product development, thinking of all sorts of different products. Now, at that time, we were still thinking we're gonna we're gonna be insulation providers. So we were prototyping and coming up with ideas for gloves and boots, anything that could be in, inflated that then would increase your warmth. So we had a lot of different cool ideas that were floating around. And through this whole wow, inflatable gloves. Yeah, like uh, you know, I remember working on one specifically for a receiver's glove that would keep the wrist really warm, but still be lightweight and very, com- very, very compact um, for a receiver. Um, uh, we were working with some sh- manufacturer, some shoe manufacturers, to get them some bladders and some argon. At that time, it was still argon to to, to test the concept, uh, how much warmth they could they could improve. But we also you know, we were developing this pretty unique ability to design inflatable products. And so all of a sudden we started getting unique kind of projects like, Hey, have you ever done a thought about doing like an inflatable cooler for your lunch bag and things like that? And we're like, ah, yeah, we're, you know, we're, 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 we're startup phase where anything goes, if we can sell it, we want to kind of consider doing it. And, um, we, one of our deficiencies is our, the prototyping aspect was just a nightmare. We were, we had this machine that would allow us to weld fabrics together, but it was like a sewing machine, but 10 times harder to get the, you know, you couldn't get the, the details that you could out of a sewing machine. So we're welding these fabrics together. We'd inflate a product. It would, it would torque weird and twist weird. It'd be like, uh, we don't know if that product doesn't work because of our design or just because we can't prototype it. So we actually ended up investing a little bit of time or a little bit of money and a lot of time into d- developing our own CNC welding machine that would allow us to design com- products in the computer. This thing would weld it up exactly like as if it was done in production over in Asia and we could test it. So we could go from design, you know, idea to design to test in a matter of literally hours at that time, days now. To compared to weeks or months for for what it would take if you did it in the normal way, so that that was really important for us because w- one day we had this idea of having. Um, I, I remember we were we were trying to develop a camping pad, right? Camping mattresses inflate. They kind of worked with what we were trying to develop. We happened to have a a partner that was in in Utah at the time that said, "Hey, we'll we'll try to help you develop this uh, this concept." In fact, it was a it was a company called AutoLeave that does airbag manufacturing. So we're like, well, let's combine what we're trying to do. You know, AutoLeave wants to d- expand their technology, maybe put their product in the outdoor space. So we were trying to use their technology to develop this sleeping pad. And I remember specifically coming home one day from a meeting where the, the, the pad just was heavy. It was bulky. You know, uh, um, airbags are not designed to hold air forever. They inflate and then they are supposed to deflate after a few seconds and, 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 and not a uh, camping mattress can't do that. So just completely frustrated that this wasn't going the way we wanted to. And I remember sitting at a stop sign with another guy in product development. And the idea just came to me like, what if we tried the exact opposite of what we're doing? We're trying to make this burly, tough sleeping mattress. What if we went the exact opposite and made a bare bones 
what, what if it was like this frame, this frame that inflates and lifts any camping mattress off of the cold, hard ground? Whoa, that's cool, right? So we went back to the office. We started putting together some ideas. We started body mapping our bodies. We, we had a glass table at the time, and we would, we would have someone lay on the table, and we'd mark, mock, mark out where the, where the pressure points, where their, where their body actually came in contact most with the pad so we could add more support there. And we started prototyping on this hand welding machine. We, our CNC welder hadn't been completed yet. And, um, you know, through, through some, some several, probably close to hundred iterations, I would, I, if memory serves me right, it seems like that many, at least, uh, we finally got to the point where we felt like this pad actually could stand on its own and didn't have to have another pad on top of it. And that was the launch of our first camping mattress called the X frame. So it was kind of born out of desperation with the, the apparel, not, not getting any, any, momentum uh us kind of working with some certain partners and having unique ability to design inflatable products and just kind of came together so we started pitching that product at the same time we were doing the apparel and while the apparel would still be like the ooh ah the gas like everyone was like that what the heck is this that's cool we were actually starting to get orders for the camping pads so that was the very you know that was the the very first signs of maybe we should rethink our whole business model here and and what products we're going to go after golly what a it's just so hard, you know, to turn away from what you were sold on when you started and then to, to go in that direction and then to have an idea while you said you're at a red light <laughs> and say, you know, let's do the opposite of what we've been trying to do. Yep. Um, that's just a lot to have to happen to make something successful, like in the sense of what if you didn't get at that idea? What if you would just continued going in the direction you were going? Like, you know, where would it be? It's uh, just interesting to think yeah. about. You know, you guys say you went in the opposite direction of, of bulky, you know, comfortable pad. Yeah, you guys just, you didn't only go in the opposite direction. You went in the extreme opposite direction. There, there, this uh, <laughs> this pad, the skeletal structure of a pad that you guys made, it's literally like, um, how, what is it called? Uh, the, the Inertia X pad. It's like, literally looks like the skeleton of a sleeping pad. Like, I remember seeing it for the first time. It really... First of all, the color, just crazy bright yellow, um, but the shape and, and the design, it it totally stood out from every other sleeping pad I saw hanging on the wall at REI, and I was like, what the heck is this thing? <laughs> I think that fabric we chose, you know, there was no mastermind behind it. It was like, factory, what fabric do you have available? Okay, we'll go with that, and it's just stuck, that chartreuse yellow green, whatever you want to call it, it's just stuck and kind of been iconic for us now but um yeah you know i wouldn't say that we we mastermind it let's let's come up with the most niche crazy thing so people will start recognizing us but that's kind of how it worked out right we were just trying to go after something minimalistic because it was exact opposite of what we were already trying and that it wasn't working and uh, and it worked in our favor because people started to recognize the brand because the product was so different we didn't we didn't get mm-hmm. swallowed up in the sea of other inflatable mattresses on the market at the time. Very different, very, yeah, very niche, very minimalistic, but people remembered it and, and, and the niche people were buying it and they were having a good experience with us. So all of a sudden we're getting, we're getting some money at least coming in and uh, we're building a, somewhat of a name for ourselves. So that was super crucial. I guess y'all figured there would be enough people out there that would want something uh, that extreme and, uh, and make, help make it happen for you guys. Yeah, we figured there's enough crazy people out there, right, that are willing to spend some money on getting some ultralight gear. So, and and it worked out. I don't think we did any market analysis of the size of the market or anything like that at the time. Um, but we we quickly we quickly added on to that product, and we added on longer ones that had more coverage and wider ones called the Inertia XL. We did an even shorter version of the torso, and so we we started taking that whole which we call the Inertia line, the ones that have cutouts, and we started to broaden that so that we could be a little ne- a little less niche than we were at the time. And, and you took the reins as CEO at some point along there, correct? Yep. Um, so I became C- I took over as, as a CEO in 2011, at which point, you know, started to turn the company away from the apparel more assertively and towards more of the gear. And in 2012, we, we took the we took the technology and the quality that we had built in the X frame and we put it into uh, what we call the static V, which is now our biggest seller and was which was really the rocket ship for us. It was the fuel that really rocked that, that, that fueled our, our growth. 
And we basically took the technology, the, the, the quality, but we put it in a, in a less niche product and we put it in uh, a pad that had full coverage. It had a V shape. So it looked, it still looked different, but the V shape had a very functional, um, reason. The V shape allowed us to inflate a pad in less air, which requires less fabric because you um you you have less shrinking right if you, you've blown up a balloon and you, you see it shrink or if you blow up an air, an air mattress as you kind of see that thing shrink over as it blows up well if you have less air then you have less shrinking um you have less shrinking you have less fabric which is less weight which is less cost etc 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 so we had the cnc welding machine at this time and we were able to try just lots of we were just trying all sorts of different shapes of how can we make things cheaper and still more comfortable and and still lightweight and in 2012 we came up with that v shape and the cost of manufacture was m- w- way, uh, you know, way more economical than a lot of our competitors. And so we came out and we priced it at a, at a mid fifty dollar price point, and it just resonated really well with legitimate campers, little bit legitimate backpackers, but also with you know, with uh, the first time guy going out out camping and willing to spend fifty bucks on, on on a pad. So that was that was a crucial leap from the X frame to the static V. Um, and, and now, now the static D line is continues to be one of the most popular products in a lot of the channels that it, that it plays in. Wow, man. Yeah. I remember getting mine. Let me think now you said you became CEO in 2012. Yep. I think very end of 2012. Yeah. I, I bought mine right around spring of 2013. Yeah. Early adopter. You're an early adopter. <laughs> oh, it's very cool. I, I actually didn't know. Uh, when I bought it, I thought you guys were bigger than you were, you know, um, or had already been established for a while, but very cool. So, so when you got on board, <laughs> was it, was it ever your intention to become a CEO or do you just kind of, just kind of happen? No, it wasn't the intention. The intention was just to have a living, right. Just to just squeak by in this startup world. I mean, it was 20, it was 2011. So it wasn't a good time for anyone in the, in the economy, still struggling times. And, um, yeah, the the uh, I, I kind of liken it to being a uh, becoming the captain of a sinking ship, if you will, right? I mean, uh, I really appreciate the the faith that the board put in me. They, like they put a lot of trust in me to do this, but it was a hell mary shot, I probably right. Like who else is going to run? Well, this guy's been around, and um, so at that time, I mean, to build it from the ground up, it was me and and matt maxfield and you know we quickly hired on another sales guy and so there's a team of three that were trying to turn this thing around so yeah it was it was uh it was scary but it was you know at that point it was a little bit of a a relief it was um with some of the shackles that we had just with with some of the dysfunctions that we had in the company before i took over ceo trying to do things with your hands tied behind your back is a lot more frustrating and scary than being able to be out there and, and kind of try to lead the company in a direction without any little shackles. So it wasn't when I was, when I was asked to do it, it wasn't like, Oh my goodness, this is scary. It was like, Oh great. great. Maybe now we can try to get this thing rocking and rolling. Of course, um, being the CEO where the buck stops on everything is, is terrifying still some days, right? <laughs> to be honest with you, it's always, it's always got its highs and its lows. But I, you know, just thinking back to those times, I'm sure I had some nights that were just sleepless over it. Like, well, you know, what am I going to do? I've never done this before. I don't have any experience. But more, more than anything, it was kind of like liberating. Like, all right, let's go kick butt now. Let's go. Let's go, go do this thing. Is it less stressful on you now? Yeah, you know, um, stress never de- de- it never leaves. It just, I don't think I'm any less stressful now than I was then, and I don't think I'm any more stressful. It just comes in different forms, and uh, sometimes. I'm good at handling it. And so other times I'm not right. And so I have to always remind myself that life is good. Uh, we, you know, really celebrate the wins that we have along the way. That's one of my big life lessons is man, when you have a good thing happen in your company, just personally, just like celebrate it, man. Don't, don't let it go up. Don't, don't jump onto the next thing too quick. Like enjoy it. Cause you're going to have some failures again tomorrow, probably. So I, I try to remember that, but not always good at it. And so sometimes that, that anxiety can creep up a little bit, that stress, but Hopefully it's mostly good that motivates motivates me and my and, and climate to do good things. Athletic Brewing is pioneering non-alcoholic craft beer. 
Yeah, I said non-alcoholic craft beer. And there's a number of reasons you might want to do that. Whether you're training for an event, which a lot of our listeners are, or you know, if, you, if you're babysitting and don't want to be drunk in case something happens. I mean, stuff happens, but you still want to sit down and enjoy the game and have a beer. This is an incredible option for a full-flavored, full-bodied beer. Each can is only 50 to 70 calories with IPA, golden ales, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings. Athletic Brewing is a great option if you want that craft brewery taste, uh, but not deal with the effects of alcohol itself. Uh, If you'd like to save 15% on your first order, go to athleticbrewing.com and use the code ADVENTURE at checkout. This episode is also sponsored by CS Instant Coffee, 100% Arabica coffee with compostable packaging. And you can find them at csinstant.coffee and use Adventure at checkout for 20% off. That's some good advice, man. And, and, I, and I think you're right. I've heard that from lots and lots of uh, CEOs and people who have uh, who seemingly have, quote, made it. Um the stress is never really that different. It's you feel it this, that you feel like it's day one all the time. Um, it's just the stakes get higher and higher, and uh, you have more responsibility, etc. Uh, that's interesting. So, 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 what do you think? You uh, what was one of the first big breaks for you guys where you thought, okay, okay, we're gonna make this, we're gonna do this. I think our partnership with uh, Costco Road Shows was really a big break for us. Um, so Costco has this program where you can go in for 10 days and sell product out of your booth, out of your, out of your pallet, um, display, if you will. And it's a consignment program, right? So you're shipping the product there. You're actually staffing it and whatever people buy from you walks through Costco's registers and you get, and you get paid for it. And so early on we had, um, one of the Costco guys that started this whole program walk by our booth in Salt Lake City at Outdoor Retailer. And they're always looking for new products to put in there, right? Especially at that time when the when the roadshow program was relatively new. Um, and I remember, you know, they walked by and kind of introduced themselves. And and I remember we got the opportunity in Salt Lake City to go do a trial run. And and that was a huge opportunity for that was a huge deal for us. And and it turned out to be successful and we started to grow the program. You know, we go from a couple of shows a, a, a month to, you know, 10 shows a month. And now we're going to do like, you know, this year we'll do like 400 different of those 10 day road shows throughout the year. And early on, early on for us to be able to go in there, we had an inventory. It was that wasn't a deal, but we could go in there and start selling our product direct to consumers like we were literally engaging with Costco customers and hearing their feedback and just understanding the product pitch, like me personally standing at the booth and, and pitching the product and what was going right and what was going wrong. People actually buying the product and, 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 you know, we were making money. We were starting to get our brand out there. It was a huge break for us. Like it was a big deal for us to be able to do that. And, um, there's not a lot of initiatives out there that you can get marketing and get that many people to see your brand and, and make money at it. Um, and, and so had we not done that, you know, I look back and I'm like, man, what, what would have kept us around and kept us going? We didn't have a lot of other huge opportunities. You know, we were starting to do conversations with REI at that time and stuff. So a lot of hopeful things, but not a lot of cash is coming in and, and cash is king and, and sales is the most important thing. So actually seeing people pay money for our product did something to our psyche that just said, yeah, heck yeah, you know, we can keep doing this. This is, this, this is good. This, we got something that, that might work here. I mean, who'd have thought? Costco. Of all places to make an outdoor brand work. Yeah, a lot of people think that that's a very you know very unlikely place, and 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 I guess it, it kind of is. Is we've kind of embraced it, right? Um, and uh, but um, I feel like a lot of other brands would have I don't know been weary in the sense of brand recognition with Costco. Um, you know that is that is not necessarily the most desirable place to have. Uh, yeah. a, you know, as far as the cool factor of your outdoor gear, but you know, they're a legit company. They, they can, they obviously helped make you guys happen. So I'm sure you don't regret it. Yeah. It re- really was an opportunity, right? We, we approached it like it's an, it's a sales channel opportunity. And, and there were a lot of conversations like, do, do we want climate to be in Costco early on? And in my opinion was heck yeah. Right. They're, they've got legitimate 
consumers that are great. I'm I'm a customer at Costco, I, you know, and the and the Costco consumers uh, reaches the gamut, right? You got some of the most hardcore outdoor guy, outdoor guys that 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 shop there. So, um, but but there was. Was, I'll be honest. There was a lot of conversation of like, do we do we want climate in in Costco? Um, but when I took over, uh, when I took the CEO role, I was like, yes, of course, we're going to embrace that. Um, and, and we we do find now, even today, that you get all sorts of buyers. You get gr- you get grandma who wants her kids to be comfortable when they come over to sleep, buying our product there. We love that. And then you get the, the hardcore guy that's going to go, um, you know, hike hike the highest peaks that he can. And he's looking for legitimate things. You get all sorts of, of, of customers. And, and really what they're all collectively looking for is something that's got great value, you know, a product that's got really good value. And that's what climate is. It's a product that performs really great at a great value um, to your pocket. It really it just really resonated. And since then, we've grown the program. Of course, we've expanded all, all of our product lines, but we've even grown the program step by step, you know. You do it step by step every year with them. So, so Costco was one big break for you, and then um, expanding your product line. What what were some of the other, what were some of the smaller wins for you that helped you build on that momentum? Yeah, well, you know, we came across some insulated. Pro- you know, we launched some insulated camping pads that were good. We launched uh, our sleeping bag line that started to get. Just generally speaking, broadening the broadening the spectrum. Um, in 2014, we did a small little raise for some additional inventories, just a couple hundred thousand dollars at the time. But at that, at that time, it was a big break for us, right? Like any money that we could get in to buy inventory just meant uh, the world to us at that time. Uh, I look back now, I'm like, if had we not got that couple hundred thousand dollars for inventory, you know, like, just like, what does that do to your momentum? Sales running out of stock is just so killer. So, you know, buy that inventory, you're building the demand, you can keep that momentum going. That was a big break for us to, to raise some of that capital back then too. And, and, and yeah, just staying nimble and, and, you know, coming to work every day and saying, Hey, what's the biggest thing that we can do today to, to help us have success? What was, was key. Ah, very cool, man. Dang. It's an adventure say the least. Um, uh, I want to go back a little bit. I've always wanted to ask this, never had the chance. I figured, you know, the CEO will know. Where did the name come from? Climate, which, you know, K-L-Y-M-I-T. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, that was before my time. So I'll just tell you the story that I hear, right? Is, uh, it was just a play on words, really. I, I um, there, it was play on words of a, how do you control the climate of your vest or your jacket? How do you control it from being a, a lightweight, windbreaker to a ski parka so there was that whole climate c-l-i-m-a-t-e concept then there was a whole hey we're in the outdoor space so we're going to be um servicing people that are climbing mountains so you know let's think about that i don't know where the k came in the spelling if i if i remember right or if i heard right i think there was a you know nate was a student at byu so i think he put a competition out there of hey what's the best logo and the name that you can come up with and or maybe he came up with the name and, and he put a, 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 a um you know a competition to come up with the best logo and and i think it was literally a student competition that people submitted their logos and 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 the, they selected the best one <laughs> definitely unique and sticks out you know a lot like your products yeah I mean, it's been great for SEO, right? Because it's so unique. Now, most people, if they hear the name, they can't find us because they don't know how to spell it. But once they see it, it's it's memorable. Uh, we, we can own it as SEO. So it's just it's worked out very favorably for us. I think it was a good move. So I like to ask this with companies that sell you know products um, that can be anywhere. Where's the coolest place you've ever seen one of uh, one of your products? Oh man. I'm trying to think where I haven't seen our pads been used before. I mean, I've seen them all over, but they're, you know, um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what peaks they've all been on. I, we get some really fun Instagram photos of our, of our, uh, of our um, distributor down in Indonesia. They're using them on the beach and in, uh, you know, in, uh, on the, the lakes and, and the ocean down there. Those are just really glamorous and, and, and a lot of fun. You know, the one that I'm probably most proud about was this, was a, a guy that I knew he bought a, he's like you, he bought a static V early on. He was a firefighter. He's actually a hot shot now. And, and he was, he, he would use the static V everywhere he'd go. And he came into our office a couple years later, like three years after buying this thing. And he had his static V with him 
And he's like, hey, can I get like a patch kit? My, It's got a hole in it. And we're like, sure, dude, we'll, fit, we'll hook you up. And he rolls this pad out and it is just the stinkiest, dirtiest thing you've ever seen. Like I can't remember how many hundreds of nights he had of sleeping on this thing in the middle of fires. And so, of course, we get, we're get we like, we'll give you a new one, but would you mind? Can we have that old one? Can we have you sign it? Can we put it up like in our Hall of Fame? Because it was the coolest thing in the world. And so, uh, you know, I can ima- only imagine all the places that that that, that, that pad was out on the mountains fighting fires throughout the year so that, that's probably my I'm, I'm most proud of that one and and we've, we've got a lot of actually we do have a lot of pads that have been shipped off to afghanistan a lot of a lot of our military people are actually using the pads too so that, that seems to resonate you know that gets that gets me pretty excited when i hear our product making a difference in those areas too that's very cool now, don't you guys have a uh, military line or military kind of styled i think that's the one i have is the insulated um it's kind of like that desert tan we have a line called the recon so we took our commercial you know our standard commercialized products that are pr- pretty vibrant in color pretty pretty brilliant in color and we put them in a more dull uh what we call the recon it's a coyote sound brand color so we do have a product that does kind of tailor to those people we've looked at being very compliant which would mean we could go after some u.s contracts and it's just a matter of priorities right if the opportunity can itself we'd be all over it but we're not actively put going out there after right now well you know maybe, maybe it's another costco for you um at some point but uh but man so I, I see that you guys have sleeping bags too and i've actually never used one of your sleeping bags um you know with as unique of a product as the uh, sleeping pads have been is there anything about the sleeping bags that are kind of set you guys apart versus other ones other companies um kind of carrying that same climate tradition into that product as well yeah, they're, they're very unique. They've got stretch baffles in them. So most people, you know, what I'd say, most people are kind of like your wife who said she hates camping. She doesn't hate the outdoors, but she probably hates sleeping in the outdoors. And honestly, a lot of people do. We embrace that. We acknowledge that. We're like, we know people love to be out there in their tents, but really when it's time to go to bed, most people don't sleep well when they're away from their bed, especially, you know, in, 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 the, in the outdoors. And so a lot of people fear that and we embrace that. And, and, and that really crosses over with our sleeping bags, right? Most people uh, either – most people don't love mummy bags because of how constricting and refined they are. And so our, our mummy bags but, – but you want it because it's warm and, it's, and it keeps you warm on a cold night. So our, our mummy bags have this stretch baffles that allow you to wiggle around and move um, at night without that constriction. But that, yeah, when you're still, it, it sucks back to your body. Um, so that makes that unique. Um, and then they have the ability to like you can – there's a little toggle on the bottom so you can shrink it up and make your feet even more warm um, if, you're, if you're shorter. So th- those unique aspects of it kind of resonate with who we are and trying to provide one product that fits lots of different people and, and needs. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I didn't know that. I'll, I'll, I'll check one of those out. Um, I'm going to need a new sleeping bag here soon anyway. Uh, is there any other products you guys are releasing that are kind of unique like that. <laughs> last year we launched a. I mean, some of some of your listeners might already know this, but last year we launched a really neat hammock that uh, it's called the lay flat. It really helps you stay flat all through the night. Doesn't taco on you with a cool shelter. Um, we we just launched a, a a bug net for all hammocks out there that's got a really cool magnetic closure that allows you to get in and out of the magnet or out of the bug net really easy into your hammock. Um, just a couple of months ago at OR, we launched a line of dog beds for any of those, you're those dog lovers out there. You know, you want your companion to be comfortable while you're sleeping. Maybe doesn't have, doesn't, there's no room on your, on your mattress. So we have a, an inflatable lightweight, really comfortable, uh, cool dog bed. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. And we've received a lot of, a lot of interest. Yeah, and then um, we're always innovating in new cat in new sleep categories. So I just say stay tuned for see what's going to come out in summer. I can't I can't uh, reveal anything else on on that line, but we're excited about some new things that we're going to be launching. So you know, I see you guys at outdoor retailer, and uh, you know you're on the top floor, which you know, means you're you're with the big boys, um, but you still are you know very small compared to some of these other big companies. Uh, how, how has it been fighting to, to make a name for yourself in the outdoors over the last, you know, decade, um, almost decade. And, uh, yeah, how, how have you and your team enjoyed that? And, and has it been, a, has it been fun? Has it been enjoyable? Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a fun fight. I think we're, we're pretty well known. Most people, you know, asked me four years ago, people would think about us for the jackets. Ask me three years ago, people would think about us for the X frame. But now, nowadays people, I think in the last couple of years have really come to you know climb it for their sleeping pads. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not an uncrowded space. There's a, there's plenty of competition out there. Um, but I think, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, the product does a great job at just winning and being memorable and because it, 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 it exceeds people's expectations. Right. So we do great at that. I think where we really need to get better is telling our story to more people like you. Right. So I really appreciate you letting me be on this uh, podcast, but like let, let people hear and see the product more in, in a broader, in a broader way. And that's where we'll win. And we, we need to be better at that. We, we we've got, we've gotten where we are because by, vir- by virtue of the product just being really good. Um, and I think we're really, I'm, I'm proud of my team, especially in the last several months and, and the strides that we're, we're making in improving our marketing and getting our story out in front of more people. But we've still got a lot of, a lot of opportunity to improve there and, and, and get in front of a lot more people. So you're talking about telling your story. What, what does that look like to you? What does that mean to you? Yeah, it's, for me, it's a lot about product, right? Like tell our story of why we, why, why our product, why you should even look at our product and consider our product. And, and of course it's in our DNA. We're engineers here, you know, we're deep in why we, 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 there's a lot of reasons that we designed a stack the V the way, the way it is, but people really, some people like that. And so we, of course, we'll try to tell the story of who we are and, um, who our designers are right now. We're, we're trying to focus on the designers actually telling people about the product, you know, people that are willing to give us five minutes of time, which isn't a lot of people. Most people want to see what you're talking, what you're about in 30 seconds. But for some people, you know, they're willing to take five, 10, 15 minutes yeah, let, let our designer tell you about this product and why it's cool and what, what, what went into the thought on the design of this product and the material selection. So we are trying to be better at that. Um, but, you know, we just, for the masses, we just want people to, to, to recognize why, why the product looks unique. And, and it's not that way just to get attention, but because there's, there's, there's functional benefits. So when we tell our story, you know, I, I want people to understand that mostly about us. I don't know. Most people don't really care about our history. Some people do like you, right? That's great. I love that. I love talking about it. But, um, for the, for the general Joe, average Joe, he doesn't really care about that. He just wants to know what the product's going to do for him. And, um, that's what I, we got to get better at telling that quicker. Well, you're, you're telling it right now. And, uh, it sounds like you guys are getting better at that. And, uh, glad we could give you a platform to do that. But, no, it's it's really cool what you guys are doing. You know, you're you're helping people sleep outside a little more comfortable at night as they're on an adventure. Like it's uh it's got to be exciting for you. Yeah, life is short, right? Like how how do you merge your making a living with what you love to do and those who can figure out how to do that enjoy life. That's what you're doing, right? With Camp Crate. It's uh, it's so cool. It's cool to see the success that you're having. Stressful, but <laughs> it's fun. Well, that that just comes with it, man. Right. Like, like if you don't want stress in your life, then don't start a company like <laughs> period. But uh, that is the truth. Good gracious. Um, you know, it's, it, and here's the thing is like, we're all, we all have our skill sets and uh, some things come easier. Some things are harder as leaders and as business owners. Uh, can you tell us, you know, for you, what has been something that's come, you know, surprisingly easy or natural and something else that hasn't been so easy? Yeah, what's been a, a more natural fit for me as a as as a as a leader? So, so I'm a pretty analytic, right? I'm an engineer, so I'm pretty analytically driven. So I, I think decision making comes a little bit easier for me. Like I can look at I can look at lots of different aspects of things and the data behind it, and feel confident in, in, in at least the some assumptions about what what we should do and whatnot. Um, so that maybe that's been a little bit easier for me. This you probably get a very different answer depending on the question, the day you ask this question to me, uh, cause some days some, nothing seems easy. Um, but I think just synthesizing data, uh, the mass amount of data and information that's out there and trying to cut the choice, ch- cut to the chase of what's the most important thing to focus on and, and, and try to tackle has maybe been a strong suit and what's been a weak point. It's just my lack of experience has been, you know, is so hard. So like not knowing what I don't know, which is everything is, you know, been so, so difficult. Um, you, you know, my lack of experience with marketing was also, I wish I would have had a better understanding or even someone in the company that could really have grabbed that and taken that by the horn three or four years ago, you know, we'd probably be in a much better position, but you know, I'm learning. Uh, by the school hard knocks we, ne- we now have some great professionals that 
uh, can lead, can help me lead in that aspect. But the marketing side has been always been a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit of a puzzle to me. Um, managing people is always the biggest challenge though, right? As you probably already know, like working with people and how do you lead versus how do you manage? How do you, how do you inspire and how do you not let mediocrity slip into your organization? It's so easy to do, you know, and all those things that that's consistently the hardest thing, but probably any leader is going to tell you that, that their, their, their team and their, their, their team is the most important thing and the most challenging thing to do. Um, and yeah, so I guess that's how I'd answer that question. It's astonishing the amount of skills we have. And, and then when you're put in a place of leadership like you, where you kind of have to have this roundedness as well, roundedness, it's probably pretty astonishing to yeah. realize just how little, you know, <laughs> you do know, or how little skill set or expertise you really have, um, until you're put in a position like that. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of fake it till you make it right. In fact, one of the, I won't tell you his name, but a CEO of another outdoor company told me one time early on, he's like, you know, if most people knew how much we didn't know, they'd probably be shocked at a lot of guys run companies, but it's what, and, but, but I think most people, a lot of people that have been through it, right. And a lot of, a lot of our finance, like a lot of our investors, they get that. And, and it's not about what you don't know and your experience. Oftentimes it's just like how much energy and passion and how much are you willing to, how much do you care really about it? Um, and, and caring about things and, and the energy and the passion can trump a lot of inexperience and a lot of not knowledge, right? Um, or at least if that didn't, if that wasn't true, I wouldn't be here because I didn't have any experience. That is awesome. Well, you know, it's uh, that I'm sure that motivates some people out there listening, saying, you know, I I have zero experience as well. Maybe I can do something like this. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you being on and, and talking about climate. I've always wanted to know the story behind the company. And, uh, I'm glad we can make this happen. Thank you. Well, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And, uh, good luck in all you're doing with camp Crate. I'm really excited for what you're, what you're doing and, and for all your listeners out there. So, well, you know, we all, we all use these products and, uh, rarely do we get to hear about how they, how they get to us, you know? So thank you for sure. Have a, have a great one. Really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Bye. 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 Well, first of all, thank you so much for listening to this episode. It really means the world to us that you want to spend your time with us. If you'd like to help us further, please just leave us a review on iTunes, share us on social media, tell your friends about us. You can become a patron, a supporter of the show for $5 a month at patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. And if you know somebody that would make a good guest, reach out. We're always looking for good adventure and outdoor stories. And lastly, thank you to our sponsors whose messages follow right now. Athletic Brewing makes the best non-alcoholic craft beer. Go to their website at athleticbrewing.com and use the code in our show notes to save 15% on your first order. After all this adventure talk, if you're needing some gear yourself, but you need some advice before buying, Go to BackpackTribe.com where you can ask questions to the owners who have experience with all the gear as well as all of it for sale right there on their website.